Rooms and Ground Aid, uh, working in IQ Regional Office, Bangkok. Uh, I'm pleased to moderate uh, this webinar uh, today. Uh, first of all, I welcome you to the second webinar on the implementation of the new global reporting format for runway surface conditions. This new methodology was developed by the IKO Aerodrome Design and Operation Panel Friction Task Force. And after approval by the IKO Council introduced in Annex 14 in 2016 as new SARF with applicability date from 5th November 2020. Detailed provision of GRF with applicability date 5th November was also 5th November 2020 was provided in Pan's Aerodrome in the same year in 2016. The GRF ensures a harmonized assessment and reporting of runway surface conditions and a correspondingly improved flight crew assessment of aircraft takeoff and landing performance. The first webinar was held on 30th April 2020, which was organized by the IKO COSCAP Southeast Asia for three COSCAP member states. And this webinar is dedicated to Pacific states. However, we have extended the invitation to other Asia Pacific states who did not have an opportunity to join the first webinar. Uh, we have developed a GRF implementation action plan template, the generic one, to provide some guidance to the states uh, how to develop the state GRF implementation action plan. And this was circulated to states through OSCAPS and PASO office. As I have mentioned, the applicability date of 5th November 2022 for the implementation of the GRF is approaching very fast and soon, and which is less than six months from now. This webinar has two parts. The first part, the presentation will be made by uh, Mr. Mahudin bin Sajuri, Deputy Director, Aerodrome Standards, CA Malaysia. This will approximately takes not more than 45 minutes. And then we have a question and answer sessions. Uh, we may have approximately 10 minutes for that. And question and answer session will be supported by the Chief Technical Advisor of COSCAF Southeast Asia, Mr. Michel Bredenberg, uh, who has made significant contribution to the works of runway safety program and IKO APAC EIS officers, Mr. Erdine Bater. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please send your question in the chat message box. As this webinar is organized, I have mentioned primarily to help the Pacific states for their implementation in the GRF. Uh, we would uh, highly encourage participants from Pacific states to post the questions and priority for the answer will be given for their question. Uh, I will select few questions that will be answered by our speaker, Mr. Maudin, and IKO colleague, Mr. Mikhail Wedenberg, uh, Mr. Eden Barter, and maybe some from other colleagues. Uh, today we have most probably more than 60, 70 participants from CA and airports. Uh, we got a very high number of interest from many states. Uh, unfortunately, because of the capacity and limitations, uh, we could not uh, accommodate all the requests we have received from the states. Uh, this is very encouraging that uh, uh, states are interested to implement, uh, eager to implement uh, GRF in their states. I hope all participants will be benefited and there will be a valuable takeaway from this webinar. 
Now I would like to introduce to you our speaker, uh, Mr. Mahyuddin bin Sajuri, graduated from University of Leeds, United Kingdom, with a degree in an electrical engineering. He has been with the DCA Malaysia since 1995. Uh, as now DCA Malaysia is converted to CAA Malaysia. He is the Deputy Director, Aerodrome Standards, Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia. Mr. Mayuddin is the trainer for Aerodrome Regulator and Service Provider in the topic of Annex 14, Volume 1, Safety Management Systems, Runway Safety Program, Aerodrome Certifications, and recently he has been uh, well known, I would say, uh, instructor as well as trainer in the area of uh, GRF. So this is his second delivery of the webinar. And he is very active in IQ APAC Aerodrome Operation and Planning subgroup. And he is the vice chairperson of that particular subgroup. So once again, uh, before I invite Mr. Maudin to start his presentations, I uh, once again remind and request all participants to kindly mute the microphone and turn off the video camera so that uh, we should not face any web ban issue. Uh, thank you very much. Now I will hand over the floor to Mr. Mayuddin for his presentations. Mr. Mayuddin, please. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. So I hope everybody can listen to me clearly. If not, uh, please give signal to me. Okay, very clear? Yes, very clear, loud Thank and... You. Thank you, Mr. Mayuddin. Okay. So thank you for participating in this online uh, training. So I will try my best uh, to take this 45 minutes to share with you. Uh, I will share with you two presentation slides. The first one is I will share a little bit on what we understand about GRF RCR. And the second part of the slide, uh, I will take a few moments to share with you the implementation program that we in Malaysia have implemented since uh, July uh, last year. So let me try to share my presentation. Hopefully you will ex accept, accept. You can see my presentation within short while. OK. Yes, Miss, yes we can, Mr. Mahudi. Please go on. So you can see my presentation now? Yes, that's right. OK, now I change to slide mode. Can you see the slide mode now? Yes, very clear. Thank you very much, Stephen. OK, today I will talk. Uh, the first slide will be on global reporting format for runway service condition. So as we know, say about problem statement, we are talking about runway excursion. It will be the aviation number one safety risk category. So among the top contributing factors are poor braking action due to contaminated runways combined with shortfalls in the accuracy and timeliness of assessment. So when we talk about GRF, the aim is to ensure the reporting of our run runway surface condition is very timely and very accurate so that we want to avoid any possibility of uh, runway excursion. So this is one of the purpose, main purpose of we do the GRF. OK, what are the contents of my presentation? The first one I will touch on what is RCR, runway con condition report. Second one, it, I will tell about objective of the RCR and then benefits. What are the benefits of RCR? OK, and then why RCR is very important. And I will share a little bit on the challenges that we in Malaysia face when we implement RCR or GRF. And I will share a little bit on the roles of agency. As you know, where we implement GRF, there are various uh, different of agency. They have got their own roles. So I will share a little bit uh, on this matter. And then at the end of this presentation, I will share to you on some IQ provision and guidance material that we can refer to ensure all the things that we do 
are being the one which is recommended or uh, which is uh, required by IQ. Okay, what is runway condition report? It's a standard reporting of runway service condition. We usually, we have already do our airport operator, our aerodrome operator already done all those runway surface condition reporting. But IQ once after we introduce this GRF, we want to ensure all the report is in standard formatting. That's one of the reason. So hopefully after this worldwide, everybody will report using the same format and it will be enable all the users, the airlines to understand very easy because all are standards. We don't want different methodology of reporting the runway service condition. Moreover, as we go on on this presentation, you will know it will be very simple in a simple format. You don't have to mention too long in words. It's very simple. So I will, I will share you after this. And then in terms of procedure, we will report the runway condition report using one system or platform, which is on snow time format. Not to worry too much when we listen about snow time format. Previously, we agree in our region in Malaysia and neighboring countries, we very rare. I think we never use this snow time. Uh, starting from 5 November 2020, we will be using this snow time format to report the runway condition report. I will share with you, don't worry. And then we must know that, like Mr. Punya said just now, the applicability of this requirement for GRF is another five plus months. It will be expected to be applicable by 5 November 2020. And we must know that the related parties involved, which is, hold on, I'll try to put on, okay. The related parties involved, the aerodrome operator, aircraft operators, pilots, air traffic controllers, AIM, metrology and aircraft manufacturers. Okay, what are the objectives of this RCR? The first one is we want to assess and report the condition of the movement area. So this is the major role played by all aerodrome operator staff, especially the aerodrome inspectors. After every heavy rain, they have to go inside the runway, do some assessment. I will tell you detail after this, what are the assessment that need to be done? And then they report in timely and correct manner. And then the second objective is to provide, after we have done all those assessment, all those measurement, produce the report, we provide the assets formation in the correct format, which is on snow time format. And the top objective is to report significant changes without delay. This is one of the purpose objective of this GRF is to ensure we report any significant changes on our runway uh, on our runway without delay. It means every after every every rain, for example, in our region we just consider the rain. After every rain, we will ask our aerodrome inspector, aerodrome staff, to go inside the runway, do measurement, and as soon as possible, as fast as possible, produce report and submit it to the AIM or ATC. Okay, what are the benefits of the GRF? First, of course, to improve safety by better understanding of runway condition. If everybody, the, the, the aerodrome operator, the ATC, the pilots, they have better condition of runway condition, so better knowledge about runway condition, so it will improve safety, thus it will affect in fewer runway excursion, like the first slide I showed you just now. And then the second one is to improve efficiency. Flight crews can better correlate reported runway surface condition to contaminated landing and takeoff performance data. Now the pilots will have a very standard format of reporting, thus make it easy for the pilot to make correct judgment, whether to land, whether to take off, whether to abort landing, whether to go around, etc. So it will make your runway very efficiently used by the aircraft. Aerodrome operators have an objective method of reporting runway surface condition to flight crews. Before this, may, we may have different kind of reporting, uh, standing water, how many millimeters, but after GRF, every reporting is in standard format. Everybody can understand, the ATC can understand, the IS can understand, the pilot can understand because everybody are using a one very standard and correct format. Okay. Okay, why is the RCR important? First one is to standardize the reporting runway service condition. We will several times see, every time we say about GRF, it is the purpose to standardize 
the reporting of runway service condition so that everybody will understand correctly. The second one is to establish a common language between all related parties in airports with one system. Aerodrome operator communicate same with aircraft operators, pilots, ATC, AI, metro, etc. So everybody will use a common language or a condition of our runway. Next one is to allow pilots to accurately determine aeroplane takeoff and landing performance. Like I said before, by receiving our correct information, timely manner, standard manner. So hopefully using this methodology, pilots is enabled to accurately determine aeroplane takeoff and landing performance. How, how much length of runway need to be uh, reserved for them to take off and landing. So this is very beneficial. The information is very beneficial to the pilot to decide. Okay, sometimes only uh, one third of our runway, for example, KLA has got four kilometers of runway. One third, 1.3 kilometers is not available. So pilot will decide whether 2.6 kilometers is enough. So it's up to the pilot. But the most important thing, the aerodrome operator give them a most accurate, timely manner of reporting, uh, sorry, of the condition of our runway. Okay. And next one is to improve aerodrome safety through better understanding of runway condition, thus resulting in fewer runway explosion. Next one is to improve airport operation efficiency through better decision making. So pilot will not waste uh, the time to abort takeoff if they receive the correct information. They just say, okay, using this information, I will decide to land because why? Uh, it's, it is safe moving. So without the correct information, pilot will have difficulty to judge correctly whether to land, to take off, etc. Okay. So the next one is the last one is to reduce environment impact through better traffic management. If less go around, the environment become better, the lesser carbon being burned on the air. Okay. Okay. What are the main agency roles? I can say very easy. The first one is the airports. Of course, the airports is the one who start all this thing. Without the assessment of the airport, the report will not be uh, generated. So the airports will assess or the aerodrome will assess the runway condition and report using RCR. The next one is the ATIs and IS. Okay, the IS will convey the information from RCR to aircraft operators. And lastly, the pilots, they will use the information with aircraft performance data to determine if landing or takeoff is safe. So all of these are the main agency roles. Okay, before we start, let us see. Uh, let us make it easy for us to understand. There are two types of uh, runway. I mean, two types of location where runway is located. So the first one is on this area where the airport is ex snow, ex exposed to snow and ice. So for this area of airport, they need to use the full global reporting format, mm -hmm. the runway condition code zero to six. So they have got no excuse. After this, I will show you more detail. But in this, in Malaysia and our neighboring countries, we just consider a simpler version of RCM, runway condition assessment matrix. I will show you after this. Because why? We are not exposed to snow and ice at all. So this is our area. So we use only the section of the global reporting format related to water as contaminant. So even though the runway condition code after this, we can see from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But if in our area, we only consider water as our contaminant, so we can reduce the code to become only 6, 5, 3 and 2. I will show you after this, don't worry. OK, so the basic methodology and understanding of GRIFS First of all, you must divide your runway into three. Okay, this is the first basic thing that you must do. You have to divide. No, I mean divide means you have to take the tractor and go. No, you have divide. It means for in, for example in Malaysia, uh, for every runway, uh, we have divided in three. For example, Kila A 1.33, we will put a small market marking just beside the shoulder. Uh, good enough, one feet times two feet, so that we know, oh, this is the first part of the runway. This is the second, uh, third of the runway. This is fine, okay? So uh, it's just just nice to be seen by our aerodrome staff, but not meant to be seen by the pilot, okay? So basically, we must divide our runway into three, okay? 
first one, second one, third one. Okay, and remember, you can see here, when talking about GRF, we always start our assessment from the lower destination number. For example, for runway 1533, we start with runway 15. That is our assessment. So when we transmit the snow temp on the air, pilot will know. For example, 552. The first five is starting from runway 15. We will see this example. The second five is two in the middle. And the two, for example, 552, the two is on the third part. So please uh, tell your staff, make sure the basic understanding for GRF is you must start with the lower decision number. Okay. What do we need to do when we go to the side? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Step one, if, for example, we go to the first third, first of all, we have to measure the percentage of contaminant. There are two ways of measuring. If your runway is busy, so you have got no leisure to spend your time on the runway, you must train your staff to measure it as soon uh, as fast as possible. What we give tips to our aerodrome staff, we say that you just estimate. Believe me, 10% is very big. So it's very rare in our country. I'm not sure about your country. It's very rare for our runway to reach 10% and above, usually 10% and below. So it depends on how busy is your runway. If your runway is busy, I would suggest just train your staff to estimate. Oh, this is around 8%, 9%, 10%. You have got no choice. For example, in Kelai, if you have uh, to measure after every rain, you have to measure, you take out your measuring wheel. Come on. Uh, all aircraft already waiting to land, right? So it's up, but it's up to, to the condition of the runway. But if you have airport like in Malaysia, we have Malacca Airport, which is not that busy, take your time. You step at, at a water ponding, you take out your measuring uh, wheel, for example, you just measure and then you report. Okay, it will depend on the uh, how busy is your runway. And the second thing that you need to measure is to the depth of contaminant. This one you cannot estimate. You have to go down, uh, take the ruler, very accurate ruler, measure the depth of the contaminant. For example, for our case, it is just water. Okay. And then the third one is you must decide the type of contaminant. Like I said before, in Malaysia and neighboring countries, the only contaminant that we consider is only water after heavy rain. Similarly, after that, you do for the second part of the runway, second third of the runway. And then you do for the third part of the runway and then you must go out as soon as possible or else ATC will angry with you. OK. OK, in this slide, you can see one example being given by uh, ACI. I have to recommend to you, all of you, if you have got opportunity to attend ACI uh, CBT, computer based training or online training. Uh, previously, we have got difficulty in Malaysia. All our staff, including me, very difficult to understand. Of course, during the last year's uh, IQ seminar, we have got some idea. When what we when we go detail, uh, it's quite quite difficult for us to understand. But after we attend this ACI training, you have to pay a little bit, very uh, minor. After we attend this uh, ACI training online course, we discuss uh, among us. So now we understand. So basically, the form that you see on your right side is not the one that will be sent, that will be submitted to the ATC or AIS. Okay, please do not submit this form to the AIS. Then they will say, what is this form? This is, I don't understand. So this is not the one that should be sent to AIS. This is the form that we need to be filled by your aerodrome staff. Okay, so you must train your aerodrome staff how to fill this form. So after they fill this form completely, they will summarize it, transfer into snow temp format. So the snow temp format is the one that will be sent to our AIS office. OK, what we'll do with this uh, form after we complete this form, we will put into our file neatly so that for further reference in case anything happened, we have got the proof, this, the, the record, the further details of the me measurement. So everything is mentioned in this form. But to ensure your staff know how to fill this form, you must train your staff. So uh, I will share on my second slide how we uh, manage to train our staff using this form. OK. OK, let us see more technical detail on this RCR. First of all, I would like to introduce and share to you a matrix 
called Runway Condition Assessment Matrix or the short form is RCAM. If you can see the one that I mentioned just now, there are six runway condition code starting with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So the best is 6 and the worst is 0. So if you can see through this, this is the simplified version of RCM. Why? Because from the beginning, we have already created uh, this form because this form is only, sorry. Okay, you can see, yeah? okay. Okay, this form is only suitable for condition dry, wet and standing water only. So this is the situation that we face in Malaysia and neighboring countries. So we take out the code four, uh, code one and code zero. I will show you after this why we take out that one, okay? But this is the simple version. For, so for initial assessment, we just consider runway condition code six, five, three and two. I will show you after this. Okay, I would, uh, this is the one. Okay, so we train our staff. Please make sure you just know what is what is the six, what is the five, what is the three, what is the two. But for the country which country which has no, for the state which has no, you must don't remember, don't forget to train your staff what is four, one, and zero. But in our area, we just tell we don't want to. You don't need to know what is four, one, and zero. Okay, so for RCM, there is thing called uh, upgrading. Upgrading is due to sometime, even though we, we decide a low category, a low code, but after pilot send their IRAP and or say they're saying that the braking action is good, so the aerodrome operator may upgrade it. For example, maybe from uh, one to become two, to become three, etc. Okay, but uh, IQ has said under this one, the statement here, I hope everybody can read. The runway condition code 5, 4, 3 and 2 shall not be upgraded. So IQ only allow us to upgrade runway condition code 1 and 0. It means like I said before, these are for the initial assessment, but it can be upgraded and downgraded. OK, let me share with you the full version of this RCAM because I want everybody to see clearly. So I divide it into three, two parts, the above part and the second part. OK, why I said just now that the number six relevant to us because for number six is it's dry. So dry relevant to every airport in this world. And the second code is number five, runway condition code five. So why we consider in our country because they have wet here. But we do not consider the frost, the slush, the dry snow and the white snow because we don't have all these condition in Malaysia. So as you saw, as you see just now, we just take out all the statement. OK, we just put wet here. Similarly, runway condition code four, we don't put at all because it is just saying for the initial assessment of compacted snow. We never have compacted snow in Malaysia. But we consider the, uh, the, the, the another part, which is condition three, runway condition code three, because there's a wet, wet over here. OK, you can see there's two wet. Condition code 3 also wet, condition code 5 also wet. What is the difference between wet in 5 and wet in 3? Is because the wet in 5 is normal wet. Initially assessment, you measure wet. So you put 5. Okay, provided that the depth of water is 3 millimeter and below. But if the water, uh, the depth of water on contaminant is 4 millimeter and above, you have to categorize it to become code two standing water okay so so here you can see okay and and under condition code three why we downgrade from condition five to three is because you can see wet slippery wet runway it means that for example if your friction test measurement fail under 0 0.42 0 0.43 and below 0 0.3 mu you have so aerodrome have operator may downgrade from initial wet to become uh, slippery wet. Or sometime after you have put the category five, uh, two consecutive or three uh, consecutive pilots saying that, oh, it's not really good braking action. It is a medium braking action. Can you see on your right side? So after you receive report from the pilot, deliver to ATC, ATCs uh, provide to you, you may downgrade 
from runway condition 5 to runway condition code 3. So there are some of the condition. Okay. The next one is runway condition code 2, eh, this area. So why we in Malaysia consider? Because this is standing water. That like I said before, the difference between standing water and wet is if you have 4 millimeter and above, straight away it will be categorized as standing water. That is why I always say to my staff and everybody, you must have a very correct ruler. Eh, ruler, Because why? If you measure 3 millimeter, it's already wet. It's just wet. But if you have 4 millimeters, only 1 millimeter different, it is already categorized as standing water. So you must ensure your ruler is very correct. At least at this point of time, the, the methodology we use is ruler. We don't have any more sophisticated technique. Okay, but next, if you can see, Runway condition 1, why we do not consider in Malaysia? Because it is just saying about ice. Similarly, runway condition code 0 is talking about wet ice, water on top of compacted snow, dry snow or wet snow on top of ice. That's why I will go back again to our simplified version. We just consider initial assessment only, runway condition code 6, 5, 3 and 2. Understand? Eh? So you can see I, we just take out number 4, Number one, number zero. Provided your, that your state don't have snow. If your state have snow, please do not uh, do like us. Okay. Okay. Let us go more detail. Under RCR, they have strings. Eh? So it is divided into two strings. The first one is what we call aeroplane performance calculation section. So because we in Asia are quite difficult to pronounce English, so I short form in to become APC. Okay. Instead of mentioning aeroplane performance calculation section, we just put APC. Easy, right? Okay. The second part is situational awareness, SA. So the first part is APC. The second part is SA. I believe they understand. Okay. What are they? I'll show you after this. So I will show you by giving you example. Can you see on below side, on the right side? This is one example I extract from one document called PANS AIM. Okay. The number is dot 10,066. So in here you can see which one is the APC. So this part is the APC. Okay, the first part. So this is the output of the snow temp. Okay. And uh, which one is situational awareness? This is the one we call situational awareness. Okay. So this is the output that need to be seen by the users, the airlines, the pilots. Okay. I will show you detail after this. Don't worry. Okay. So please take note. This example is for uh, an airport, an aerodrome which have three runways. So if your airport have got only one runway, you have only one line here. Quite straightforward and simple. Like I said before, can you imagine pilot only see this one, can only see this one, they already can judge their braking action, stopping action, etc. Okay, very easy. It made your life very easy. Hopefully, yeah. Okay. Okay, let us see on the first part of the APC. Can you see the logo on your right side above? I just Google it, 811. We always see 711 in our country. But for GRF, we change to 811. Why? Because the APC part have got 8 and the SA part have got 11. So very easy to remember, 811. But don't mistaken by 711, okay? So what are the 8 elements or items of APC? The first one is the aerodrome location indicator. Can you see on right side, it is M. M means mandatory. So you have got no excuse when you declare the first string of this APC section, aerodrome location indicator shall be mandatory. The next one mandatory for you to declare is the date and time of assessment. Please be remember for snow time, you just need to declare the month and the date only. You don't have to declare the year. I will show you the, the example after this for to make us easy to understand. OK, and the next one we will have to mandatory mention about the lower runway decision number. For example, if your runway is 1533, you must put here 15 only. You don't put 15 slash 33. No, you must put 15. If your, your runway is 14R32 left, you must put one four right don't put the 32 left okay i will show you the example after this so this is mandatory we must declare it the next one is runway condition code for each runway third i have shown you just now 
the RCM matrix. So it is either 5, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, 0. So I will show you after this. It will either 5, 5, 2, 4, 5, 5, 5, okay? 5, 5, uh, 3, example, etc. Okay, this is mandatory also. But the number 5, 1, this is conditional, which is the percentage coverage contaminant for each run weighted. Why IQ means is conditional? Because you can see on my notes here, if it is dry, we don't put dry, we put NR, no report. If it is less than 10%, for example, we estimate or we measure the contaminant is just 8%, for example, 8% of the first third is uh, full with water. So we don't put 0.8, we must put NR. Similarly, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, we just put NR. If it is less than 10%, that's why here IQ said it is conditional. And then number six is the depth of loose contaminant for each renovated. So why is it conditional? Only if it is standing water, you put. Okay, if it is less than uh, the standing water, you just put and I will show you example after this. So make it easy for us to understand. Next one is mandatory is condition description for each renovated. For example, wet, wet, wet means the first part is wet, second part is wet, third part is wet. Sometimes wet, dry, dry, or wet, standing, standing water, standing water. So I will show you after this. Okay, this is mandatory. And the last one, the eighth one is optional. The width of runway to which the runway condition code apply if less than published width. This is for example, if your runway full with snow or ice, but we don't have that case. Eh? So your tractor, your vehicle, only manage to clean the middle. For example, your runway is uh, 45 meters. So only manage to uh, clear the middle 30 meters of the runway. So here you put 30, okay? But it is optional. You can declare or you might not declare. And plus, in our area in Malaysia and neighboring countries, we don't have such thing as ice or slush or snow. So we just make it blank, okay? Okay, the second part of the runway uh, condition code string is what we call situational awareness section or SA. So there are 11 items, but you can see here, most of the items are optional. Only one is mandatory, one is conditional. Let us see. The first one is what we call the reduced runway length. For example, if you have your runway is four kilometers or simple reason, uh, three, three kilometers. So the first third of the runway full with water. So you not tempt it to declare the LDA is just two kilometers. So under here, you put the LDA available is two zero zero zero. After that, I will show you the example. Okay. But if you have full stretch of runway, the full three kilometers is available. So you just leave blank on this section. Understand? Okay. So that's why this is conditional, dependent on whether you have full length available or just some part of the length available. The second part is not relevant to our area, but I just mentioned to you. If you have drifting snow on the runway, you just put drifting snow. So pilot will know, oh, on the runway, there is drifting snow. Okay, the, part, the, th the third part is loose stand on runway. If you have loose stand on the runway, you just put loose stand on runway. But like I always say to my airport operator, if you have loose stand on runway, please clean, clean them first. I would rather you clean them first, then you publish to the pilot that you have loose stand. Clean first, and then don't publish anything on there, okay? Next one is you, if you have chemical treatment on the runway, this is mandatory. But in our case in Malaysia and neighboring countries, we don't have to put any chemical treatment because we don't have ice, slush, snow, etc. The next one is not relevant to us. If you have snow bank on the runway, you just put snow banks on the runway. If you have snow bank on the taxiway, you shoot uh, snow bank on the taxiway. Okay, similarly that. Okay, the next one is taxiway condition. After this, I will show you examples so that everybody understand. So it is still optional. You may declare, you may not declare. For example, if the condition of one of the taxiway is poor, say taxiway Bravo uh, have got uh, plenty of water on it. So you just say taxiway Bravo poor. You don't have to measure the depth. You don't have to measure the percentage you have to declare. You just say taxiway Bravo poor, taxiway Charlie poor, taxiway Echo poor, for example. Of if all the taxiways are poor, you just put all taxiway poor, but poor to the pilot because how they want to go out from the runway to the apron if all taxiway poor. So make sure you have got no all poor, okay? And the next one is apron condition. 
Similarly, if you are, for example, northern apron and southern apron, you just mention northern apron poor, southern apron poor. But all the apron poor, how can they park their, their, their aircraft? Okay, make sure they are not all poor. And then the number 10 is state approve and publish use of measured friction coefficient. For example, just now when we downgrade from code 5 to 3, it is related, if it is related to the friction measurement, you can declare here. You can declare it, but you may not declare because it's an optional. And then the last one is plain language remark. If you want pilot to have some uh, further notification or information, you can put here under plain language mark agreed by the state. Okay. To get us uh, more detail and more idea for us, remember, I will give you example one by one. What are the eight items on the APC? Okay, the first one is WMKK. Remember, this is mandatory aerodrome location indicator. So in KLA, the aerodrome location indicator is WMKK. The second part, which is mandatory, is the date and time of assessment. Okay, before I forget, please bear in mind for APC section, all items is separated by a, a space, eh? a blank space here. Okay, but for the SA situation awareness, all items are separated by a full stop. That's the difference. We can see an example after this. Okay, the second part is the date and time of assessment. Remember I said just now, when talking about date, you must start with the month, not year. 0925 means 25th of September. And then it is being followed by the time of assessment. 1400 means 1400 hours in UTC. Remember, don't put your local time. 1400 in UTC, okay? The third part is the lower runway designation number. Remember, after this, when talking about GRF, we always declare the lower runway designation number, not the direction of the landing or takeoff, but always declare from the lower runway designation number. Okay? Okay. The fourth one, which is mandatory also, is the runway condition code for each runway third. Remember, I show you just now the runway condition assessment matrix. It start from 654310. So in this example, it is 552. It means wet, wet, standing water. Okay. So this is mandatory. And then the fifth one, which is conditional, talking about the percentage coverage contaminant for each runway third. So 50, 50, 50 means the first third of the runway, 50% of it is full with water. The second part of the runway, 50% of it with full of water. The third part of it, 50% uh, of it full with water. Okay. So after this, I will show more detail on the next slide, how actually we come to the 50, 70, 75, 100, etc. Okay. This is conditional. Okay. The sixth one is the depth of those contaminants for each runway third. Just now I said to you, if we have three millimeter and below the depth of the water or any, any contaminant, we don't put 030201. We must put NR or it is dry NR also. Okay. So we just put NR, NR. But if we have four millimeters of water depth, we put 04. If we have, for example, 10 millimeters of water depth, you put 10. If you have uh, 100 millimeters of uh, uh, water depth, you put 100. Okay? But if you have 3 to 1, don't put at all. You just put NR. So it means that in this example, the first third of the runway, it is either from 3 millimeter and below or dry. The second part of the runway, it is either 3 millimeter or below. But the third part of the runway, pilot will know that, okay, there is a standing water there. The coverage is 50% uh, and the depth is 4 millimeters. So it's very easy for the pilot to know. And then he will decide accordingly. Okay. And then the, the next one, which is mandatory, is the condition description for each runway third. It is related to the number four, you see. Wet, wet, standing water, 552. Remember, five is wet, five is wet, and two is standing water. And the number eight item, it is not mandatory, it's just optional, like I said before. So that's why in this example, the aerodrome operator is not declaring the number eight because all the full 45 meters or 60 meters of the width of the runway is available. Okay, so you just put blank. So the full example of the, the APC section of your runways 
or condition report is like this. WMKK space 0925-1400 space 14L space 552 space 50-50-50 space NRNL04 space wet wet standing water. Number 8, you don't have to put anything. Okay? So these are the examples. So let me elaborate more on the number 5, which is the percentage of coverage of contaminant. You can see here this example. If the first third of the runway is less than 10%, you just put NR. Eh? If it is, for example, 9%, 8%, you don't put 0, 09, 0, 08, 0, 07. Okay, you must put NR. Similarly, second, second third of the runway, NR, third, third of the runway, if it is less than. Okay, another most important thing that you must know, if, for example, you have, you estimate or you measure the percentage of contaminant is 20%, for example. Please do not put in your SNOTEM format to become 20%. You must square the value to become 25. For example, if you estimate the percentage is 40%, don't put 40. You must put 50. You must square it to become 50. For example, here, if you have estimated 60%, don't put 60. You must square it to become 75. And then last one, for example, if you have estimated 85%, don't put 85. You must put square it to become 100. So this is the area. So for example, if we see the snow temp to become 30, 40, 40, so it is strong. You must square it to become 50%. Understand? Eh? Okay, let us go to the second part of the uh, strings of the RCR. Okay, we call situational awareness section. Okay, let I put pull out the previous uh, table. Okay, you can see here, what are the things that I'm declared under this example? Airport operator only declared the first part here, which is reduced runway length. Runway 22L, LDA reduced to 1450. Maybe the full length of the runway is 2 kilometers, but some part of it is not available. So you know, time it to say that our LDA is just 1450. So in this situational awareness, it is conditional for you to put this statement. Runway 22L LDA reduced to 1450. It means the pilot understand that your runway available LDA only 1450 meters. Remember, it must be separated by a full stop. Eh? Uh, full stop here, you can see. Okay, the second part is drifting snow on the runway. So if you have drifting, drifting snow on your runway, you just declare drifting snow. Pilot will know, okay, there's a drifting snow on your runway. Okay. And then you, you see the example here. The airport have decided not to declare because they have, don't have loose sand on the runway. They don't have chemical treatment on the runway. They don't have snow bank. They don't have snow. So they skip all and they start declare the next one, which is the condition. So here in this airport, the pilot know that only taxiway Bravo is poor. Maybe some part of it is being sold in the water. And then the next example is apron condition. Apron not poor. So pilot know that, please be, be aware that uh, the north the not poor uh, north apron of this airport is not that good. Maybe some area is soaked in the water, but the southern part is okay. So like I said before, most of the item in situational awareness is optional. You may declare or you may not declare, but in this example, the aerodrome has decided to declare only four of the items. Okay. This is the snow temp format that will be submitted to our AIS office. So, so please make sure uh, we have to train our aerobe staff, our aerobe personnel, especially on the aerobe operation, operation side, how to fill this snow temp format. Actually, it's not that difficult. After we have trained our staff, we can see it's not that difficult. But to make it not difficult, you must attend the training by ACI, I recommend, okay? <laughs> so it's not that difficult, actually. I think it's much, much easier than the no time format, if I know second. Okay, so you can see here, this example, where you can get this example? You can get this example from Pants AIM, eh? DOC 10066. So, uh, lately, IQ has transferred most information of the snow time and uh, no time to this uh, new document, Pants AIM. So, if you refer to NX15, not many uh, mention about uh, snow time. So, you must refer to the Doc uh, 10,066, uh, which is the name is Pants AIM. 
So you can see here, it is applicable as of 5th November 2020. So if you have got opportunity to go to this document, inside the same document, there is one Snowton format, which is applicable before 4 November 2020 and before. This is the current Snowton format. But for the GRF, please make sure after 5th November 2020, you, you use this format. It's a little bit, it's, it's a different, okay, it's different. So the below part of the snow time format is like this. So it's not that difficult if you train your staff, you can see. So we uh, manage to train our staff, okay. So this is the one you must train your staff to fill. This is the output that you must send to the air traffic controller or AIS, okay. Okay, I always want to share with you what are the challenges that we made during the implementation. The first one is the RCR should contain all necessary information for the definition, etc. So if you send your staff for training and hopefully if you have attended this uh, very short training, you have got some idea what is GRF RCR is all about. Yeah? OK, so the cha second challenge is aeron personnel should have the skill and knowledge to assess the condition of runway and proceed produce accurate runway condition code. This also you have to train your staff. You have to train your aerodrome staff. Uh, how to uh, accurately determine uh, the condition of your runway. Okay. The third challenge is coordination with relevant parties. Please bear in mind, not only aeron operator involved in this GRF, you must have coordination with the uh, airlines operator and also the air traffic controller and the AIS. They must also be in the loop. You must always remind them, not, not really remind, but uh, have some uh, session with them Tell them this is the one from 5th November 2020. Please do not surprise if we submit some form. Please do not say, How, why are you su submitting snow them? We don't have snow here. No. So please make sure from now, you must share with your pilots and your country, in your state, and also the ATC AIS. Don't surprise if 5th November we submit to your snow time for men. Eh? You must know what to do. Eh? Okay, these are the one, uh, a challenge that we need to ensure. Okay. Next one is the establish of Malaysia standard reporting format. So since uh, last year, we have sit together and draw still in draft stage all this reporting format. OK, and the fifth one is I always mention several times. The most important thing is you must training your staff, you train your staff. So different level of student exposure. Our staff is not similar. Some of them 20 years service, some of them five years service, some just join the service. So we must cater the training to suit all of them, okay? And reluctant to give up method and practices for many years. Some of them maybe, maybe says that, oh, we have been uh, several years using this method. Now you want to introduce new one. So there may be some challenge a little bit. And then the third one is management or change. So you have to do the management or change so that all your staff ready for the change. And then last one is how to ensure accurate assessment as busy runway. For example, I said just now, if your runway is busy, don't take your time. Oh, take out slowly your measuring device, walk slowly, the ATC already, uh, come on, come on, get out, no. So it is, you must train your staff. If you are measuring a uh, contaminant in, on KLIA runway, for example, please do it fast, but accurate, for example, okay? But for uh, non-busy airport, it's not that challenging, okay? So what are the roles of different agency? A road operator, assess the runway surface condition, to deploy the GRF, to provide the training to aerodrome staff, air traffic service have to convey the information received via the RCR or the IRAP. The, uh, the aeronautical AIS provide information received in the RCR to end users. The aircraft operators utilize the information in conjunction with performance data provided by aircraft manufacturers and also aircraft manufacturer to provide the necessary performance data in the aeroplane flight manual. So these are the roles of different parties involved in this GRF, okay? Okay, I would like to share a little bit what are some of the IQ provision and guided material that is relevant to this GRF. The first one is Annex 6, talk about the new part two aeroplane performance manual, DOC 10064, new assessment by the pilot in command of the landing performance and report for the commercial air transport operation. So all the pilots uh, beginning November 2020, must uh, ensure the pilot is well trained and have access to this new part of Annex 6. And this next one is Annex 8, the nature of information are provided by aircraft manufacturer. If you have manufactured aircraft, so you must uh, consider this requirement. 
So mostly in our area, we consider this document and it's 14 volume one, which is applicable in 5th November 2020. The eighth edition is the latest one, but inside in this eighth edition, there are some area which is available, uh, which is applicable before 5th November, some area applicable after 5th November. So make sure after 5th November, you just consider the one that is relevant. But now you don't consider the applicable after free number first. Okay, this NS14 volume one is the fundamental provision for assessing and run, run, uh, reporting runway surface condition. Some part of it tell about this RCR, but most part of this GRF RCR is being mentioned in this Fence Aerodrome.9981. If you have already access to this 9981, it tells about everything aerodrome certification, safety management system, safety assessment. Aerodrome manual criteria, that kind of thing, and including this GRF matter. Okay, it's very important for you to ensure your aerodrome staff is being trained in 9981. So we have included 9981 as one of the module module in our training syllabus. And can for detailed uh, method of assessment and measurement, IQ has released the new circular circular 355, which says about assessment, measurement, and reporting of runway surface condition. And for the fence, uh, the air traffic controller, they have document pens ATM.4444. And then the next document that um, might be relevant is NS14. But like I said before, the latest edition NS14, most of the thing related to SNOTEM and NOTEM has been transferred to the doc 1066, the pens AIM. So make sure you have access to the pens AIM because it tells you how actually you want to produce a SNOTEM format. Okay. So roughly, this is the provision and it's 14 volume one, doc 981, doc 1066 and circular 355. So we must ensure our staff well trained on all this documentation. So thank you very much. Uh, please allow me to share a little bit on my second presentation, uh, which tell about the implementation program in our country. Okay, the title of this slide is GRF RCR and Runway Inspector Program. So we have decided in Malaysia, even though it's not that required by IQ, we have decided that alongside this GRF, we will certify our runway inspectors or SI inspectors. So IQ requires all the aerodrome inspectors, runway inspectors to be trained. So we have decided in Malaysia, we must issue them a certificate. Okay, we go alongside. So the main objective is to ensure aerodrome personnel trained in the relevant fields of competence and their competence verified in a manner required by the state, CM, us, to ensure confidence and accuracy in their assessment. It is mentioned in S14 Volume 1, Section 2.9.4. So if I go to the audit, I want to see, can you show your certificate or runway inspector? So if he managed to show, it's been signed by us, CM, so it means that this particular inspector already have already undergone all the necessary training that we have uh, put into the condition. Okay. So, okay, I will tell about the GRF implementation roadmap in Malaysia, CRI program, approved training module, and train the training session in Malaysia. Okay. So, this uh, I, I'll try to make it fast. Yeah. Clear objective, total runway inspection movement, regional coordination. We are ready to work if anybody interested to share with us. Okay, these are the roadmap. We have started in July 2019, where we established working group and term of reference. Okay, we sit together after we went back from Bangkok, the seminar. So we form a team headed by us, by me as a chairman. And uh, the, the members are all those experts from uh, Malaysia Airport Company, Malaysia Airport Berhad. Okay, uh, in the next month, we a working group workshop, we conduct a working group workshop between the aerobe operator and CM aerobe standard, which is us. And then in September 2019, we enrolled ACI online course, which is very beneficial to get some idea. Actually, many ideas, most ideas we get from this training. And then next one, we prepare the runway inspector and certification and RCR guidelines. So we managed to produce it, but it's still under draft stage. And then uh, we the first training we conduct with CAM, some of the experts we invite, we conduct the training. So everybody got, got a real idea how it is all about. And then the company Malaysia Airport Holding Berhad submit a budgetary application to their management and they, they approve it. 
because we need some budget, some money to conduct training seminar, etc. And then uh, we engage our ATC, our EIS office in October 2019. In November, uh, the training center start to develop training modules under supervision of me. And uh, in January 2020, we in Arab Standard CM we endorse the training module. And the first train the trainer session we conduct we managed to conduct before uh, the MCO in February 2020. I will show you after this the picture. And then uh, we plan to start it in February 2020, but unfortunately uh, start the travel movement uh, limitation. So all of this we have to postpone, but we we do it online now. We do the engagement online. Okay. Uh, all the stakeholder, we already asked our airport operator to engage online through online, and this is still under draft stage. Hopefully, by June 2020, we uh, do the trial period. Uh, hopefully, if we do this, we manage to catch the timeline of 5th November 2020. Okay, so these are basically the six uh, training that is required, mandated to when before you can certify uh, to become a certified runway inspector okay airport operation level and s40 you can read after this because i'm short of time and 19 aip rt communication airroom inspection so the grf is inclusive is included in this airroom inspection so you can see some of them the validity is every three years so every three years they are required to refresh the training okay you complete all this training we will issue a certificate okay these are the training modules and it's 14 volume one and it's 19 sms the modules AIP modules, we train them how uh, AIP related to aerodrome. The RT module, we mandate everybody runway inspector must have very good RT phraseology skill. And then, okay, this is the aerodrome inspection modules. You can read after this. Okay, talk about GRF, RCRC. We train our staff here in, in snow temp issue and procedures. We do some case study. And we train them aero manual because aero manual formatting is a little bit different from 974 to 9981. So we train them on the new format inside the 9981 pens aerodrome. rope safety requirement, all those kind of things, we train them. Okay. So these are the modules inside the aerodrome inspection modules. So these are the GRF RCR modules. It's around one, one day, 1.5 day. Okay, these are the training, uh, train the training session. So I just do the opening to encourage them. And then I sit at the back and watch them. Okay, the rest they do it themselves. So on your right picture, you can see all this. We invite airport managers. Uh, if they cannot come, they will send the uh, operation managers. We have engineering uh, people here. We have uh, aero operation staff. We have training centers, uh, human resource people here in our first session. Okay. So this is the one that I love most because they manage to do a mock runway. It's not as big as runway, but they do the mock runway so that they have some feeling just beside their training center. So you can see here, there's a runway horizontal position marking, there's a runway destination marking, there's a mock uh, uh, aiming point marking here, okay? So these are the practical assessment. We train them how to fill the form and we train them how to measure using wheel provided your runway is not busy, okay? On site assessment, everybody goes to down, all those airport manager uh, go down and learn because, because after this they want to train us, we expect them to train their staff. So we simulate the mocking area there. We don't pour water, eh? we just put a bottle and we put some, some, some border to see this is the water. Don't pour water, then you have got so many time to dry it out. Okay. So after all the assessment completed, you train your staff to fill the RCR form. So CRI is requesting approval, somebody from another side of the walkie-talkie acting as an air traffic controller. So the driver uh, requests approval before entering runway. So you can see on the below part, they measure the water in the bottle. We simulate using bottle or water. Okay, measuring wheels. Okay. These are the closing ceremony. So I think that's all. I'm sorry, Mr. Punya, I took some of your time. I, I hand over back to you. Thank you very much for listening to my speech. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, you, thank you very much, much uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayudin. Uh, uh, it was a really, was a very, really very uh, excellent, excellent presentation. presentation. 
and I see in the chat box uh, there are not many questions. So that makes me feel that your presentation was so clear. Everybody understood what they need to do uh, before 5th November 2020. So however, uh, we got few questions. Uh, let me see. Uh, we have question from Samoa, India and Nepal so far, but still we have a time you can post into the chat box. Uh, regarding question from Samoa, uh, there is uh, some message from Mikhil Bredenberg. Uh, I, I hope uh, the response to your question is uh, this will help. So I, uh, so if uh, that is the information provided by Michael Bredenberg is helpful, I don't think it is required to be uh, clarified by the speaker as well as the IQ auditor. So let's go to some other questions uh, where we have not seen uh, some clarification in the chat box. Uh, so uh, Samoa has uh, said that uh, uh, it's fine. Uh, so India has a couple of questions. So I will pick one question that is uh, how to decide runway condition code in case of multi-layer or multiple contaminants on runway in each runway turn. Uh, Mr. Maidin. Okay, yeah, thank you. I will try to answer, but maybe if I'm wrong, Mr. Mikel will correct me. So according to what we have read, if you have multiple contaminant, you may add all the total of contaminant and you estimate how many percent. And it, another way is you consider which of the part of the contaminant which is uh, relevant, which is may affect the safety of your uh, of your uh, aircraft landing on that particular area. So you must train your staff to to plus, to add all. For example, this is 1%, 1%, 1%, total is 3%. Another way is you must uh, think that which one of the third one, maybe you have small, 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 but only one is big. So you might need to consider only the big one. But like I said before, it is very rare for us to get more than 10%. It's very big. For example, 1.3 times 45 meters. To get 10% is very difficult. Usually in our area, if we get 10% and above, we will uh, decide to close the runway. We clear the water. Moreover, because our runway is all cambered or it's one side slope. So we very rare to have very long time of water which is not drained out. So that is my answer. But maybe Mr. Mikhail, if I'm wrong, you can uh, correct me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mikhil uh, Bredenberg, uh, if you have some supplement information uh, with respect to that particular questions, uh, you can please add. Thank you, Dr. Puyan. No, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Mikhil Bredenberg. Uh, okay, let's uh, see next question. Uh, one interesting question from Nepal also. Uh, in case of KLIA, only water is contaminated or also the rubber deposit? Uh, Mr. Mayudin. Okay, thank you very much. I can answer only water is the contaminant. We don't consider rubber deposit in this uh, GRF. But bear in mind, if you have thick rubber deposit, you may decide to downgrade like, like I said just now, if we have initial assignment of five, but if you have very thick rubber deposit, according to experience, if this uh, rubber deposit is quite thick, it may slippery, you may need to downgrade from five to become three, the slippery wet. But you don't have to declare the uh, rubber deposit as contaminant. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayudin. 
uh, maybe we will spend a couple of minutes for some other questions we have been receiving. Uh, okay, from India, as the depth of different part of runway may vary according to slope of runway, so at what place on runway we have to measure the depth to decide the runway condition code? Uh, Mr. Mayudin, please. Thank you for the question. It's a very good question. We have discussed this in Malaysia, so we have decided we will measure the most depth. For example, if the area have uh, the, the, the most deep is 4 millimeter, we will report the 4 millimeter. We don't report the 3 millimeter, 2 millimeter, 1 millimeter. So that's what we have decided in Malaysia. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mahudin. Uh, I think uh, we are running out of time and uh, I would like to make one announcement that uh, after uh, the question and answer sessions, uh, we would like to request uh, delegates, participants from uh, Pacific Island to stay back for about 10, 12 minutes and the rest can go. Now I would like to ask, maybe pick up two more questions and then we will finish this particular webinar. Uh, so it's from Philippines, has KLIA done actual inspection run on a single runway with contaminants? If so, what is the average runway occupancy time of the CRIS? I don't really get that question. Can you repeat, Mr. Punya? Yes, uh, has KLIA done actual inspection run on a single runway with contaminants. If it is done, what is the average runway occupancy time? I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. Maybe I'm not sure. Uh, I have to refer to our airport operator. I'm sorry. OK, uh, thank you. I think maybe you can send us uh, in the offline later on. Uh, so that we can uh, send back to Philippines. OK, one another uh, interesting question also from Philippines. Is friction test needed before implementation of GRF systems since we did not conduct one? OK. I can say to you that uh, this uh, friction test uh, falls under different requirement. If this GRF is not being introduced, it is uh, mandatory for us to uh, regularly uh, conduct friction test measurement and the frequency is dependent on the number of jet aircraft movement, if I'm not mistaken, in our runway. So regardless whether we implemented RCR, GRF before or after this or not, it is a separate requirement that you must regularly uh, conduct friction tests on your runway. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayudin. Uh, Dr. Punya, so, shall I add something there? Uh, yes, please, uh, Mr. Mikhail. Yeah, thank you and good day to all. So just to add to what Mr. Mayudin said, which was correct, is that uh, uh, the friction measurement is no long, is not part of the GRF implementation. Uh, so it becomes strictly a requirement for airport uh, uh, runway maintenance programs, you know, but not for the GRF uh, implementation and not for the reporting of runway surface conditions. It's purely for, for runway maintenance. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mikhail. OK, so uh, we will pick up one last question. I have not seen uh, there are any question from uh, Pacific Island states. Uh, so in that case, uh, one I think from Cambodia, if the second part of runway on code two with 75 percent, 
how to declare landing distance, reduce landing distance available. If the second part of runway on code two, I mean code two runway with 75% uh, probably it's a coverage, how to declare LDA reduce? Okay, this is another thing that uh, I would like to uh, share my opinion. If it is not under JRF also, the reduction of the available length of LDA is dependent on the assessment made by your uh, runway inspector. That's why you must ensure runway inspector has been trained. Not only because of water or JRF, but there are several other reasons. Maybe there are cracks, maybe there are uh, serious depression, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So to answer you, uh, I think uh, if according to your assessment, maybe in circular 355 you can train yourself to further assess or reconnect your runway. If you decide on your second, second third of your runway is not fit to be landing, to be landed, so you have got no choice whether to declare the first third of your runway is the final third of the runway which is available for the LDA. Okay. But uh, regardless of whether you're doing it during RDF, uh, GRF RCR or not, but it's, it, you have to train your staff to ensure the LDA is the one, is the one, the length that you think according to the competency, the knowledge of your runway inspector is available to be land landed by the aircraft. Maybe uh, somebody can counter. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayuddin. Uh, I think now uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Mayuddin. A lot of thanks to you uh, for your excellent presentations and it was uh, really, really helpful. And I believe uh, with these presentations and the reference material uh, provided uh, by IKO, Airport Council Internationals, and also some training offered by IQO SEI, uh, IQO IETA, and in future, uh, IQO Council, which is coming up for ANS people, uh, would be very, very helpful for the implementation of GRF. And I also thank uh, our friends from Pacific Island states and from other uh, states uh, for attending uh, uh, this webinar, uh, despite of uh, not very convenient time, probably for that site, uh, especially for the Pacific friends. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed and uh, this would be helpful in the implementation process uh, in your respective states. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so once again, uh, uh, I would like to request to stay back Pacific Island States uh, delegates for a couple of minutes. Uh, Mr. Kong, uh, the flight safety expert would like to have a small announcement. And the rest of the participants, you can leave this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we, IKO also conducting a webinar, a panel discussions, uh, consisting of uh, the Rapporteur of Friction Task Force member, Airbus and IAZA on 26th of May. So you can uh, register. Uh, I think uh, we have widely circulated uh, the website where you can register. And similarly, with respect to snow thumb, more information about the snow thumb, uh, you would like if you would like to know, you can register for 28. And that particular webinar is for uh, European countries, but uh, if seat would be available, that will be provided to you. So once again, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayuddin, and thank you all of you. Uh, Mr. Kong, now I would like to hand over to you. Thank you, Punya. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Right, uh, my name is Kong. I'm with the flight safety section of the IKO APEC office. Uh, the purpose uh, of 
this briefing is actually uh, I, is for IKO APEC to reach out to the Pacific Islands uh, colleagues uh, regarding the filing of the COVID-19 contingency related differences. Right. So if you are related uh, or you have any activity involving the USOP online framework regarding the filing of the COVID-19 contingency related differences, please stay back. All right. And uh, I will share with you uh, some information to provide further guidance on how to file the COVID-19 contingency related differences. Just give me a moment. I would like to share some uh, a short presentation with you. Okay, can everybody see uh, this uh, slide that I put on? Yes, Kong, uh, COVID-19 pandemic CCRD FOD. Right, thank you very much. Let me turn this. Okay, so now uh, we all know that this COVID-19 pandemic has affected a lot of uh, people, a lot of states, a lot of activities, all right? The purpose of uh, this CCRD, which is the COVID-19 contingency related differences and the filing of these differences, including uh, declaring the differences a state may accept uh, from other states flying into their country would be very useful when it comes to uh, handling of ongoing flight currently. All right and also for the resumption of uh, flight activities later on. Okay, so this is the purpose and the validity of this briefing. And this COVID-19 contingency related differences is meant to be a temporary filing of differences, all right, which will at this moment be in effect if there's any filing done until 31st March 2021. So when you file the differences, be mindful that this is only up to the period from now till 31st March 2021. All right. Until uh, advice further, all differences filed under this COVID-19 will expire by 31st March next year. Okay, for those who have uh, author authorization to access the CMA online framework, you will see two new applications. All right. One is the, on the left hand side, is the application for filing of the CCRD. And the application on the right hand side is a summarized report of the CCRD and the EFOD reports. Currently, okay, fortunately, I think uh, most of you are with the uh, aerodrome area. So currently, there are only nine CCRD identified by IQ that require filing. And uh, these are related to Annex 1, mainly on the licensing issues, uh, medical issues, uh, extension or expiry. Uh, expiry of medical review, expiry of uh, crew licenses, and then on the Annex 6, Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3, there are six differences, and these are mainly related to uh, the current provision on crew experience requirement, uh, crew currency requirements, which may not be achievable during this uh, pandemic period due to the various 
travel restriction and uh, quarantine uh, requirement from different states. All right. So if you open the new application on the OLF, on the one that is, I show you earlier on, on the right hand side, you will see this particular form. All right. This is how a state would file a CCRD. And for this, if you look at the top, you will see the standard is 1.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. Can you see where my cursor is? All right. This is the this is the standard currently in uh, Annex 1. All right. And I give you the example that is filed by Cambodia. All right. By the way, all this information are public information, which is accessible through the online framework. And uh, so there's no secret. I'm just uh, taking, uh, so happened, I just picked Cambodia as one of the example to show how the differences for this particular Annex provision is filed. So for recognition of other state differences, I, Cambodia has accepted other IKO contracting state, um, state members differences. All right. So with this knowledge now, if another country airlines would like to uh, start operating flight into Cambodia, they know at least, all right, there is no lesser consideration, all right, with Cambodia as far as the the crew licensing regarding this this particular provision is concerned. The second box is the detail of differences. All right, is the validity of uh, Cambodia has a uh, documented validity of medical assessment will be extended by three months. So this is Cambodian decision. They have decided uh, to extend the medical assessment. All right, and by this I assume that after the current expiry. They decided to extend it for three months. So in Cambodia's case, uh, all their medical assessment, if you look at it, all right, uh, if it ends in March, okay, it will be automatically extended for three months uh, under Cambodian uh, situation. And the last row is for Cambodia to fill up their rationale and the their mitigation condition, all right. And here it says that Cambodia will issue advisory circular to, to extend the validity of the medical from 31st March until 30th June. That's the three months that you are looking at, and that's the three months that described by Cambodia. Okay, I would like to pause here for a moment to check with you if there's any question. Okay, if not, I'll just move on. All right, for you to page through the various differences, if you go back to the online framework, you will see these two button, previous row and the next row. All right, you keep on paging to the next row and you will have covered all the nine CCRD differences that is identified by IKO currently. So on the right hand side uh, circuit, in red circle, you see a, a number three there. It means that I have somehow shown you is what I show you is a page three now. It's page three of nine. Okay, so I have I'm done with the filing of the differences. Now I like to go on to the online framework the new application regarding the CCRD and the EFOD report. All right, you see there are two parts to this. One part is report by states, and this are talk, we are talking about all the IKO member states, which consists of 193 or 92 members. All right, on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is report by regions. All right, so you can actually customize it a little bit from the, all the states in the world to regions. And what happened is, all right, if you start on this page, if you leave that, you, you notice there is a square checkbox here where my cursor is. If there is a tick inside, that means you are actually trying to retrieve report for all the states. 
which will consist probably of thousand over pages. Right? If you want a particular state report, what you have to do is uncheck this box. Then you will activate this drop down box here. And this drop down box is go by alphabetical order. All right. Then you click on this button here. A list of state that has filed the CCRD will appear. All right. And be mindful, not all the states are listed there because they may not have filed the CCRD. All right. After that, you select, you go down further a little bit and you select either report sorted by state or report sort by the ICAO provisions. ICAO provision, this means is one of the nine current ICAO provision identified uh, for the CCRD. Then you follow by generate CCRD and you will get the report. Similarly, you do the same on the right hand side, but this time you go by the region here now. All right. Everything is the same. All right. Uh, and this is how you generate the report by the region. Question. Okay, I move on. Okay, this is coming to the end of my presentation now. This is an example of uh, a state uh, Australia has been uh, extracted. This is how Australia has filed their CCRD and this is how it will appear. All right, remember there were three boxes that a state need to fill up, right? So what you see is these three boxes here. Here one, two, and three. These are the three boxes. This is the IKO annex reference, it's a standard. This one is the description of the ICO provision. And these are the three boxes that a state would need to fill up when they sub before they submit the CCRD. Okay, this is another example uh, of uh, another state. This is Hong Kong and Indonesia. You see now I have selected the CCRD report sorted by provision and the provision selected is uh, 3.9.4.2 of Annex 6. And this is the different way different state would file their CCRD. Okay, with uh, any questions so far? Okay, with that, uh, I think I've got no further to add. And uh, let me go back. Let me go back to the, the meeting. All right. So uh, I hope that would help provide a little bit more information on how a state may work on the CCRD. Currently, uh, there's quite a lot of state in the APEC region has completed and submit the CCRD. All right. Uh, what we are seeing is uh, those states that have not completed CCRD are mainly from the smaller Pacific Island states. So I hope that will the, the, the short briefing provided uh, earlier would provide some clarity and some uh, some encouragement. All right. And if you need further uh, assistance, do not hesitate. All right. You can reach out to, uh, I think you're more familiar with Punya. And uh, then I, and, and I will uh, request Punya to forward all these requests to uh, myself. And we will try to help you as much as we can. Thank you very much. Punya, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kong. Thank you for excellent presentations, your explanations in a very uh, short time. Uh, that's very good. Uh, this information, I believe, our friends from Pacific Island states and those who remain here uh, will pass on to the respective uh, department of uh, 
CAA. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, as Mr. Kong has mentioned, uh, come back to us. Uh, if through PASO directly to us, uh, me, Mr. Kong, Mikhil Bridenberg, uh, Mr. Netawa, so uh, as appropriate. So IQAPAC is anytime ready to help you in this regard. Uh, so that's all from uh, my side also. Uh, thank you very much once again. And also I would like to thank uh, IKO colleague uh, who are behind the scenes and uh, helping me uh, conducting this webinar. So thank you to the whole team of IKO as well. OK, thank you. Have a good day. Uh, good evening. Uh, whatever it is, uh, depending on where you are. OK, thank you. Bye bye.